To be reformed is to make, some, make a few changes, to be a little bit different than the world. And then to be transformed is to be totally different from the world. That's what we're shooting for. That's what we need to be. We're going to talk about all three. First of all, let's talk about being conformed to the world. That means you're just like the world. That's the easiest thing in the world to be, is to be just like the world. Jesus talked about a straight and narrow way, and he talked about a wide gate and a broad way, and many there be which go in thereat. That's the easy gate to enter. That's an easy way to walk because the majority of people are going that way, and you just kind of go with the flow. You just are like everybody else. That's being conformed to the world. 1 Peter chapter 3 talks about being fashioned according to the world. That's the idea of this word conformed, is to be fashioned in the image of something. In this case, it's to be fashioned in the image of the world. Uh, you can tell I don't know a lot about fashion. Most preachers don't. But there are people who keep up with fashion, and they keep up with fashion trends. They know what the go-to items are this year. The couple of items that you've got to have in your closet this year if you're going to be according to the current trends of society. And I'm not against trends, and I'm not against being fashionable. My wife picks out my stuff because I don't have the sense to do that. I'm thankful she does that for me, and then she tells me I'm not wearing it right or I'm not doing what she intended me to do with it. I didn't buy that tie to go with that shirt or that suit or whatever. But I'm thankful for people that know about those things and keep up with those things, and I, I'm not against being fashionable unless being fashionable is against being godly. You know, some of the fashion trends are set by people in Hollywood. If people in Hollywood are setting anything by which you're living your life, I'm a little bit worried about you because their lives are a mess. And if you're fashioning your life according to their lives, you're probably going to be a mess too. Amen. I know they make a lot of money, and I know they have a lot of ability and talent in certain areas, but they know very little about this. They know very little about how God would have us to be fashioned so we have to be careful about that. And a lot of people just go with the flow. They're just like everybody else. They're just conformed to this world. Let's think about what the Bible says about being conformed and about what the Bible warns us against. You know, God was concerned with this in the Old Testament. You think about Exodus 23 and verse 2. Don't follow a multitude do evil. 1 Samuel 8 and verse 5. You know, don't be like the nations round about you, but they were wanting to have a king so they could be like everybody else. They saw the other nations, what the other nations were doing, and they said, well, we'd like a king to watch over us. We'd like for a king to make our decisions. We'd like for a king to... And God says, you don't know what you're asking for. First of all, I'm your king already. I'm already doing all those things for you, and I'm going to do it a lot better than any earthly king's ever going to do it. But God says beyond that, they're going to take your sons and they're going to take your daughters and it's not going to be all good. But God's people wanted the king because they wanted to be like the nations around them. And there's a desire to be like the people around us because it's just, we want to blend in, we want to fit in, we don't want to be different, be conformed to the world. Now, there's a lot of pressure to be like the world. You ever done an, uh, a science experiment, and I'm not a scientist, but... You do certain science experiments to show certain things, and one of the science experiments that people do is to show the air pressure that's all around us. You know, we don't even realize that there's this pressure that exists all around us. And that if the pressure inside of us doesn't match at least the pressure outside of us, that we're going to have a problem. We're going to need pressure back. The way you illustrate that is you take an aluminum can, maybe like a, a, a can that mineral spirits or paint thinner or something like that would come in. Dump all that out. You don't want that in there for what I'm about to tell you to do. Or you'll blow yourself up and somebody else up with you. So don't pour it all out. Rinse it out real good. And just put a little bit of water in that can. And then put that can over a flame. Let that flame heat that water in that can until it's boiling and bubbling inside. And then screw the cap back on that can. Take the can away from the flame and just hold it for a, a little bit of time and let it cool down. What's going to happen to that can? It's going to crush inward. It's like some giant hands, invisible hands that you can't see, are pressing in on that can, crushing it. Why? Because when you heated that water, it forced some of the air out of that can, 
And when you screwed the top, top, top back on, the pressure outside was greater than the pressure inside, and that caused it to crash. Well, the, the air pressure around this is about 15 pounds per square inch, if I remember that right. I hope I did. But the idea is that the pressure inside of us is the same as the pressure outside of us, and so that's why we don't get crushed by it. We don't even know that this pressure is all around us, but it is. You know, a lot of times we don't realize the amount of pressure that the world is putting on us. The world's trying to crush us. The world's trying to mold us into its image. We don't even realize that's going on sometimes. You're in school. You're at work. You're in, in, in sports. You're in these various areas. And there's a lot of pressure for you to be like everybody around you. Not to be different. We don't even realize that pressure's there, but it, it's there. And so sometimes we, we fail to live up to that pressure because we don't have an equal purpose inside of us or a greater purpose inside of us. I want you to go to Daniel chapter 1. I want you to see from Daniel 1, 3, and 6, three chapters in Daniel. I, I love the book of Daniel, and I like the first six chapters better than I do the rest of the book because the last part of the book is pretty hard, but the first part of the book is really practical. Practical in the world in which we live today and dealing with the matter of peer pressure. As a young person, Daniel is my favorite book. As there are some heroes in Daniel. Daniel being one of them, Daniel chapter 1. But you remember these young men were carried away from their homeland. They're 800 miles from home. I've been 800 miles from home, but I wasn't 800 miles from home when I was 16 years of age or when I was a young man. 800 miles from home. They were brought into the king's service, which I guess was a blessing in some ways because you, you had some things that other people didn't have, but probably the first thing they did is they made you a eunuch. That, that wouldn't be much fun, I'd say. I'd pretty, pretty say that put a stop to a lot of dreams that you had for your life. That's what happened to these young men. But not just that. The king was determined, we want you to be a Babylonian. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to change your name and give you a good old Babylonian name. Oh, we're going to change your language. Don't be speaking that language you came with. No, you're going to learn Babylonian language. Oh, and, and by the way, we're going to change your diet too. You're going to eat what we eat from now on. Oh, and, and, and by the way, we're, we're going to teach you new customs. We're going to teach you a new religion. We're going to reprogram you. You know, if you were to go and join the Marines, you know what the first thing the Marines are going to do? tear you down, and build you back. They're going to reprogram you. You're going to be a Marine the rest of your life whether you like it or not. They're going to reprogram. They're going to make you a Marine. They're going to make you think, act, and do like a Marine. That's what you're going to be. That's why that's a brotherhood. I mean, you, you meet a Marine. Marines, they're brothers. Because they've all been through the same reprogramming. All have the same programming inside. Well, that, that's what they were doing to Daniel now, you think about 800 miles from home and all this reprogramming going on. It would have been easy for Daniel just to forget all about the God of heaven. He, he's not around the God of heaven anymore. The God of heaven is 800 miles away as far as it appears. He's right there with Daniel. We know that. Everything about Daniel's life has changed from everything he's ever known. You talk about those invisible hands crushing on Daniel. What kept Daniel from being crushed? He had a purpose inside of him greater than the pressure outside of him. Daniel 1.8, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the king's meat. You know, it was not easy. And it won't be easy for you. Daniel had to go to the keeper of the eunuchs and he had to say, Sir, I know you're in charge of me and I know I'm just a captive and I, I know that whether I survive or I, I die depends in part upon you. I can't eat that. I, I, I can't drink that. My God says it's wrong for me to do that. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to give me a special diet. You want what? I want a special diet. Hey, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I'm the keeper of the eunuchs. The king's holding me responsible for you. And if you don't turn out, he might kind of turn on me. I might lose my life trying to save your life. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, wait. But God brought Daniel into favor with the keeper of the eunuchs. The keeper of the eunuchs said, okay, we'll have a test. We'll test you for a little bit of time. And if you pass that test, okay, if you don't, we're going back to my way because I'm not losing my head for your head. 
And sure enough, they passed the test. How easy it would have been for Daniel just to say, I'll do what all the other captains are doing. I'll do what other the eunuchs are doing. You know, I just got to beat them. I, 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 I'm, I'm 800 miles from home. What about Daniel chapter 3? You think about Daniel chapter 3. You think about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're Babylonian names because they went through the same root programming. Maybe the king set up a great image, probably a great image of himself, maybe a great image of one of the gods. But he said when certain musical instruments are played, everyone's supposed to bow down and worship that image. Well, that's a problem because God's people don't worship images. They worship God. Musical instruments played, and now Mishael and Azariah don't bow. They remain standing. A lot of pressure on them to bow because if everybody else is down on the ground and you're not down on the ground, you stand out. So what do you do? Well, oh look, my shoe's untied. It's taking me a long time to tie my shoe. Oh, the musical instruments have stopped. I guess I can stand back up now. Well, I've dropped, I've dropped my keys. Better bend down to get those. Or, or maybe you justify it in some other way. Maybe you say, I'm standing up on the inside. I'm bowing down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. God knows my heart. God knows I don't really want to do this. Well, that's not what they did. Oh, but that's just the beginning of the pressure. Because they get reported to the king, and the king says, and he's being gracious. The king is being gracious. Let's give him the benefit of the doubt here. He says, maybe you didn't hear the rule, you know, you're from another country, it's another language, and you're new to this. So maybe you, you didn't, so he reminded them what the rule was. He gave them another opportunity to do it. And he, he's got the furnace right there. And they say, King, we're, we're not careful to answer you concerning this matter. You see, our, our, our God is able to deliver us, but if he doesn't choose to deliver us, we're still not going to bow down. You talk about courage, that's some courage. But why did they have that courage? They had that courage because the purpose inside of them was greater than the pressure outside of them. They'd already made up their minds long before they got called in before the king what they were going to do. He heated that fire seven times hotter. It was so hot that the men that were throwing them in died as they approached the flame. God's children were okay. Why? Because God protected them. Daniel chapter 6. Remember the king passed the law, you couldn't pray or make a petition of a God for 30 days. 30 days. Daniel's an old man by this time. Daniel could have said, you know, I've served God my whole life. He's not going to punish me for 30 days. It's just 30 days. It's not. It's just a month. It's not a year. Daniel could have made a lot of excuses, but Daniel didn't do that. The Bible tells us that Daniel, knowing that the petition was signed, he was in ignorant, doing this in ignorance. He was doing this fully knowing what the law was. He went in and he did as he had done it four times, the Bible says. The windows are open. He doesn't close the windows. He was praying three times a day. He doesn't go down to just one time a day. No, he, he's keeping the schedule he's always had. He's so always had an appointment with God at 9 and 12 and 3. He's going to keep those appointments with God. I'm going to change those. He's not going to let men pressure him into being something that he's never been. You know, if, if you're serving God when you're a young man, you get to be an old man, that's polycarp, right? God's been faithful to me all these years. I'm not about to deny him now. Bring out the lions. Bring out the fire. Bring out whatever you want to bring. I'm not giving up my inheritance at the last minute because you want me to. Because there's a purpose inside of me greater than the pressure outside of me. Let me ask you, is there a purpose inside of you greater than the pressure around you? Because there's a lot of pressure around you. There's a lot of pressure for you. Not, not just to tolerate the homosexual movement, but to accept it. And to promote it, so to support it. You know, there's a lot of pressure. But if there's a purpose inside of you greater than that, they can threaten you with a lot of things like Daniel 1, Daniel 3, Daniel 6, and you're going to stand strong because 
You're not going to be conformed to this world. That's the first option. But most, for most of us, we're not going to be conformed to the world. We, we know that the world is lost. We know that the world is going to hell. We know that the world is on the wrong course. So we, we opt for the next option of the approach to the world. And this is where a lot, a lot of members of the church fall. And that's being reformed. You see, we clean it up a little bit. We don't completely be transformed into God's image. We just clean it up a little bit. We don't, we don't go see every movie that the world goes to see. We'll go see most of them. We don't watch every TV show they watch, but we'll watch just about what they'll watch. We don't listen to every song on the radio that they listen to. There's one or two that we'll turn down, but most of them we just let them play on. You know, we wear a one-piece instead of a two-piece. We cleaned it up a little bit. You know, we, we, lo- we learned in school about the difference in Reformation and Restoration. Martin Luther was a reformer, Protestant Reformation. He nailed his 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg, Germany. That took a lot of courage. You know what the Catholics did to you if you disagreed with them? They, they put you to death and they didn't do it quickly. They drew it out. They, they, they were learned from the Romans in crucifixion. They, they made it last a while. I, I, I travel overseas and travel to Catholic countries. You know they have museums of Inquisition? I've been in several of those. You walk through there and you see their torture devices. We didn't come up with waterboarding. They were per- masters at it long before we ever got the idea that we might do that to somebody. Oh, they, they, they had instruments where they'd lay you out on a table and a, and a, a, a blade would swing back and forth. And they would lower it inch by inch until it cut off a slit across your stomach. Then they had another little hookup where they'd take the intestine and roll it up slowly. They were masters. And, and I went in this place in Mexico one time and this guy was dressed in all this Catholic religious garb and came in the door and he was there collecting our money to go see his torture devices. I went in there and I said, Sir, how do you, how do you justify all of this? This is your religion. This is your history. How, how do you justify this? You know what he said? He said, those were the dark days of the church. Dark, he just brushed it, just the dark days of the church. We're not like that anymore. Dark days of the church. Well, yeah, they were dark. Horrible. Torture devices. So what Martin Luther did is Martin Luther says, I don't like indulgences. I don't like the sale of indulgences. That's just not right. We need to reform that. We need to fix that. That's different than restoration. Restoration is, let's not just clean it up a little bit. Let's go back and be the first century church. Let's go back and do what they did. Let's speak where the Bible speaks. Let's be silent when the Bible is silent. Let's do Bible things in Bible ways. Let's call Bible things by Bible names. That, that's what restoration is, and it's different than reformation. But a lot of Christians are satisfied with reformation. They're satisfied with just reforming their lives a little bit. They clean it up a little bit, but they don't get to being what God wants them to be. You think about Asa. I think it's 1 Kings 15, 11 through 14 in the Old Testament. You read about a man named Asa, and he was one of the good ones. But he wasn't so good. You know, I, I sometimes teach about Herod the Great. I call him Herod the not so great. Because he's not so great. He did a lot of bad things. And Asa, he did some good things. In fact, if you read the text, you're going to find out that he sent the Sodomites out of the land. That's a pretty good thing. I mean, that's a pretty bold step. He said, you don't belong in our land. Get out. He tore down the idols. He said, we don't worship idols. We worship God. He took his mom, who was the queen, and he got rid of her because she was an idolater. You talk about a bold move, that's a bold man. The Bible says that he removed not the high places. Let me give you a modern illustration of that. My weight goes up and down. Maybe yours does too. Maybe you have the same struggle I've had my whole life. Do you know what I've learned? Don't keep those fat clothes in your closet. When you go on that diet and you lose that weight, you get rid of those clothes that you used to wear. Because if you don't, three months from now, your skinny clothes will be getting a little tight on you. 
It's so easy just to switch. So that little pair of pants, that's a couple inches bigger. Now you're up a couple inches, and then you're up four or five inches, and then you're up six or eight inches. Why? Because you, you didn't remove the high places. You left them in your closet. They were too easy to go back to. That's what we do. We don't get far enough away from the world. We, 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 get, we clean up some things, but we don't give it up everything. And before we know it, we're inching back into the world and that old man and that old life and that old way of talking, that old way of dressing, that old way of living comes back into our lives again. I want you to think about a passage with me. And, and it hit me when I read this. Ephesians 4.27 Neither give place to the devil. Don't give the devil an inch in your life or he'll become the ruler of your life. That's true. That's true. But you know what that word place means? It means a passage. And it refers to a passage in a book. Don't give the devil a line in the book of your life. Because if you do, he'll write the whole story. But you think about how that operates. Okay, you want to get into Hollywood. Why do you want to do that? I don't know. But you want to get into Hollywood. You want to be a star. So what do you want? Just give me one line in the movie. Just make me an extra in the movie. As soon as they give you a line in the movie, make you an extra in the movie. Next, next, you want to be a supporting actress or actor, right? Maybe just a supporting cast. And then before you know it, you want to be the star of the show. You know what the devil does in your life? The devil says, just give me a line in your life. Just give me one passage. Just give me a line in your movie of your life. And then he'll be the supporting cast and then he'll be the star of the show if you allow him to. John 14 and verse 30. Jesus told the disciples that He was going to die. That the prince of the ruler of this world was coming. He says, but He has nothing in me. He didn't have anything in our Lord. If He had had anything in our Lord, He would have ruined it for you and me. He never got a foothold in my Lord's life. He never got into his thoughts. He never got into his speech. He never got into his actions. He never got into his dress. He had nothing in Jesus. How much does he have in you and how much does he have in me? Because if he's got a foothold in our lives, it isn't going to be long before he's coming after us. We've got to get to the last one, don't we? That bell means something. I don't know what it means, but it means something bad for me. Five minutes. Please. Five minutes. Let's talk about being transformed. The word is metamorpho. We get the idea of metamorphosis. We get the idea of a caterpillar turning into a butterfly. You know, caterpillars are ugly. You may like them. They're ugly. They're, bugs are ugly, generally. They just are. But they, but an ugly caterpillar turns into something beautiful. I want to tell you about something else. I, this hit me. I was preaching a sermon recently on John chapter 2, turning water to wine. And I thought, all these years, I've preached on this and I've talked about this, and I didn't see what God was really trying to tell me about that. You know, as far as the miracles of Jesus go, that's about as tame as they come. About as mundane and ordinary as they are. I mean, he didn't feed thousands. He didn't raise the dead. He didn't heal the sick. He didn't steal a storm. He changed water to wine. And I, I'm impressed by it. I did ranks pretty low on the list of miracles as far as my ranking of them until I really think about it. Because it isn't really about turning water to wine. That's impressive. But what's really impressive is what he turned those men in the room with him into. That was just a sign, John says. It was a sign of what the Lord could do. If the Lord can do that with ordinary water, what can He do with ordinary men? That's the message. The message is, what's He going to do with you and me? That's the point of the text is, if He can do that to ordinary... Now I want to show that to you. Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John... And perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled to acknowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Unlearned and ignorant men. Ordinary as water. And the Lord turned them into something that turned the world around. Turned the world upside down. 
But you think about what Jesus can do. Jesus turned fishermen into fishers of men. Jesus turned skeptics into believers with Thomas, didn't he? He turned hotheads into peacemakers for James and John. He turned a persecutor into a preacher with Paul. He turned saints into sinners with the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. I'm impressed by water to wine. I'm impressed by what he turned those men into, but let's face it, I know myself better than I know any of those men. And I got a long way to go. The Lord's working really hard on me. He says, you're just an ordinary boy from Alabama. You don't even know how to say certain things. Talk too slow. But I'm going to use you anyway. You're going to be my Amos. You're going to go to the big city. You're going to preach to the kind of nation. You're going to tell them my message. God takes ordinary people and he transforms them. You know, I can't be conformed to the world and you can't be conformed to the world because God's already determined that we're supposed to be conformed to the image of His Son. Romans 8, 28. He predestined us. I don't like that word, but I like the word when you're talking about this. God determined from all eternity, you're not going to be like them. You're not going to be in their image. You're going to be in the image of my Son. That's the plan that I have for you in your life. That's the plan that I want you to follow. That's who I want you to be. I want you to look at Colossians chapter 3. I want you to see something. Then the lesson will be yours because they've already rang the bell on me. I didn't ring the bell on anybody this week. <laughs> and here I go, I get the bell rung on me. So <laughs> That's true, that's true. They kept me in the dark. That's another thing they did. They kept me in the dark and didn't let me know where the bell was. Because I would have probably rang that bell a time or two. Just to ring it. Colossians chapter 3. I want you to look at verse 8 through verse 10. It says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another, since you put off the old man with his deeds. And now put on the new man, who is renewed in knowledge, according to the image of him who created him. We were made in the image of God, and God expects us to be renewed through the knowledge of his word into that image. We're supposed to be in the image of His Son. Let me ask you this lesson. If I ask everybody to bring their cell phone up here and put it on the front pew, and I just started picking up cell phones, don't know who they belong to, and I say, let's check out the music we have on this cell phone. How would your music be different than somebody in the world? If I were to go to your house and say, let's look at your recently viewed list on television or movies, let's see what you've been watching, how would it be different than somebody in the world? I went to your closet and said, let's, let's look through what you, what your clothes. How would they be different? You know, we, we've done a good job of telling people, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, you're a peculiar people doesn't mean you're weird. We've done a good job of, of really pushing that in the church. We've done too good of a job of pushing that. Amen. I go overseas. I go to Mexico. You know how well I blend in in Mexico? <laughs> I don't blend in at all. I don't speak Spanish, and when I do, it doesn't sound like Spanish. But I stand out. Why? Because I'm not from there. And they know I'm not from there. They know I'm an American as soon as I see it. When they stop me on the road to extort money from me, I don't get the gringo discount. Oh, they give me the full price. Because they, they know, they, and they know that. Well, the Bible says I'm a stranger and a pilgrim. 1 Peter 2 and verse 11, in this world. If I blend in in this world, there's something wrong. If they don't know, if I don't stand out like a sore thumb, there is something wrong. Because I'm supposed to stand out. I've been bought with a prize. I'm supposed to be different. And if I'm not different, there's something wrong. If my playlist, if my dress, if my speech, if all these aspects of my life are the same as the world, or just cleaned up just a little bit, I use a euphemism instead of a cuss word. I wear a one piece instead of a two piece. I don't wear either, but anyway. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I mean. Then I've just become reformed. 
And reformed will get you lost. Transformed is the only thing that will save you. Thank you for your attention. Amen. Amen.